There we go. All right, it says we're recording. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Rosenthal. I'm a park naturalist at Gulf Branch Nature Center. Uh, I'd like to welcome you uh, or welcome you back to tonight's deep dive. Um, it's fun putting all the uh, all the emails in and, and seeing lots of familiar faces and, and, and new ones as well. So I'm pretty excited about that. So today uh, we are going to talk. Um, initially, what I thought is this would be the antithesis of a Valentine's Day program. Who needs love? Um, but the topic uh, kind of grew a mind of its own and um, took me in a, a different direction than I expected. Hopefully it'll still be, uh, it'll meet uh, your expectations this evening, but I'm gonna go ahead and get us all set here. Whoops, I did not share my screen, so you guys don't know what I'm doing. Let's try sharing the screen and then starting that. All right, here we go. Uh, so tonight's topic is who needs love? And uh, I found a surprise the answer. As I said, um, I didn't, I wasn't exactly sure what I was thinking at the time or, or what I was thinking since. And, and this really, really changed on me a little bit. I, I wanted to look at initially um, the opposite of mating, which is, is what uh, obviously uh, for humans to reproduce, we need a male and a female, or at least the male and the female um, uh, gametes, the the egg and the in the sperm, uh, in order to create a, a new person. We don't have a, many other options. Some other organisms do, and some other organisms absolutely do uh, different things. And I had wanted to explore those more, but um, I really got into kind of the question of where did uh, sexual reproduction come from? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, um, we're going to talk about some asexual reproduction, uh, and that is, and I got some definitions. Going, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I ho uh, hope you guys know I like to do that. Um, it's a reproduction in which new individuals are produced from a single parent without the formation of gametes, um, and they tend to often be um, exact duplicates, same chromosome number, uh, and, and very much um, exactly the same genetic makeup as uh, the adult. Um, and the real question is, why would you go through asexual reproduction and avoid sexual reproduction? Because uh, I expected to spend most of the night saying, who, you don't need males, and taking shots at guys the whole time and, and being good natured about it because um, for for many, many organisms, the female is, is absolutely the most important and in and, and some um, they simply can do without. Um, but I, I found that um, it was a there's a lot more to it. There's a lot more um, questions to, to really ask there. So I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to start by reviewing some of the shortcomings of uh, sexual reproduction. Um, hopefully there'll be some new things in here and some uh, some different stuff. If some of you have seen some of my other presentations, there's a little bit of a review of that, but uh, it's important to talk about um, the struggle of sexual reproduction in order to understand why the advantages of asexual reproduction. Um, and again, sexual reproduction, there's, uh, it's the fusion of two reproductive cells. Um, uh, obviously, in, in mammals, it's, it's the egg and the sperm. Um, so there is, um, there's a lot of pressure uh, and there's a mechanism for evolution through natural selection um, where there is sexual selection and, and which very much uh, affects the uh, genetic makeup of a population. So here's two prime examples of males um, in which uh, on the right we have the uh, the northern cardinal, very bright bird, and that's not a um, a plumage for breeding season. That's the year-round plumage. Congratulations, you're bright red. It's going to help you get the lady. Uh, it's going to make it a little more difficult to hide. Now luckily for them they're small um, and that small can certainly help um, reduce the impact of being such a bright color and then having to hide from from larger predators. Um, something interesting I just learned on the left we've we've got the moose which is a really uh, large herbivore. They got the antlers. The antlers fall off every year. So in addition to having to walk through woods like that, like I think it'd be fun to try that once, but to spend the better part of the spring, summer and fall with that on my head and at a time when um, the branches are most dense with, you know, leaf and leaves and foliage and all that. Um, that just seems, seems daunting. And that rack is essentially for 
uh, impressing a female, just like with white-tailed deer. You've got this, these, um, these bony projections going on the top of your head. Um, they could definitely make it difficult to, you know, move through the woods, but they're absolutely uh, essential for sexual selection for for the females to to take a look at you. Uh, and what those antlers can say is that you're very good at finding food because you have to start in the spring to grow that rack. You got to you know eat and eat and eat spring and summer show that you're really good at finding um food uh it also shows that you are robust and, and healthy and probably not full of parasites for example uh and so you know the sexual selection for um beautiful birds for um well antlered moose is, is really important and is really an important part of uh sexual reproduction interesting i, I also discovered that moose that have a bigger rack um, one of the the um, structures on their rack actually helps them hear. So moose with larger uh, antlers also have better hearing, uh, which is kind of a, a nice side effect to having to walk through the woods again with that with that big thing on your head. Um, but this takes a lot of energy to maintain the color or to to live with that color. It takes a lot of energy to grow these large reproductive uh, structures. Um, that are so important in sexual selection, uh, and the same is true for for plants. You know, growing a uh, a flower and putting all the energy into growing a flower to attract a pollinator, uh, and then in this case, this is bloodroot. Um, afterwards, you're going to produce not just a seed, but you're going to produce a seed that's got a little oily bit on it. I think, it, if I remember correctly, it's called the lysosome, which is going to attract ants. So the ants will take your seed, eat the lysosome, and then discard the seed in there discard pile which will protect it from other seed eating organisms until it can grow as a new blood root. So you, there's there's a lot of um, energy. For example, in this case, just in, in, in looking pretty, whether it's the um, the flower attracting pollinators or whether it's the, the, the uh, males attracting the female um, and then cleaning up. You know, it's, in some um, species, you, you need to spend a lot of energy preparing uh, a space to display or to um, attract a female and show that you're good at finding a home. Uh, house wrens uh, do this. They'll in a they'll uh, defend a territory and make eight or ten dummy nests. Because and then the female will be like, yeah, this is great. Yeah, I like I like the places you selected. But she'll never use one of those dummy nests. She's going to make her own nest. Um, but she'll inspect the territory and the male will show her all the dummy nests he made in the areas. And she might uh, use one of those sites, but she didn't take all the the material out and then put her own stuff in. Um, in this case here, we've got a, a bluegill. If I remember correctly, I think this might be right off of um, uh, the, I think it's uh, the fjord at uh, Barcroft. Um, the going east, like on the uh, east corner, uh, closest to the east corner of the athletic field, uh, there's a space there where there's always a lot of, of bluegill and they make these um, areas. And what the blue, the male will do here is the male's not only cleared out this area, he's going to spend time uh, displaying and, and attracting females. The problem is, in addition to putting all that energy in, if you're a smaller male, you don't waste your energy in doing that. You're going to look like a female, uh, and you're going to roll up and um, position your body in such a way that um, you look like a receptive female. You're going to respond to everything the male does. You're going to give off the essentially the vibe that you're a female and you're very interested in him. What happens is the um, once the male has um, a large number of, of females attracted. Um, these are fish, so it's a, an external fertilization. He will release sperm in the water. The females will release their eggs, and the um, eggs will be fertilized, and then you've got your young fish. Except what happens is some of these females are actually um, males that aren't big enough to attract their own harem. And what the males do, these males do, is they'll release their sperm into the cloud, so they'll actually be able to fertilize some of the eggs. And then at the same time, there will be other even smaller males they can't even pass as females that have just been skulking in skulk is going to be my big word tonight skulking in the corners and they come zip it in and they release some sperm in the cloud and zoom, they swim back out and so now you've had one male do all this work expend all this energy prepare this area uh, attract these females and all these other males benefited too so I, I'm just I'm going to keep talking about uh, energy and time and, and the effort it takes to to go through sexual reproduction um, we got a uh, Eastern, or excuse me, American bullfrog on the left. You got a fall field cricket on the right. Um, they spend a lot of time calling. They call to attract females. Um, and, they, and bullfrogs don't have a specific time, so they will 
may call to attract a female throughout the uh, the winter, uh, the summer. Um, uh, oftentimes, their trad tadpoles take two, maybe even three winters if you go further north uh, to develop. So it's going to be a couple years before. So they don't really have a um, uh, a deadline like uh, wood frogs that want to get in, mate, get out, and give their young the, the quickest chance they can. Um, these, whoops, somebody, if you could mute, thanks. Uh, the fall field cricket here is do the same thing. Going to find a place, going to call. Um, now, what both these um, organisms have in common is they're going to spend a lot of time calling. That exposes you to predation. Uh, and the chance that, and, and and again, there's there's always some risk involved, but it exposes you to the chance that a predator will find you and eat you. Um, the other thing, though, is you will find smaller bullfrogs that don't have a good call or don't have a, a good uh, calling perch. They don't have a good territory, and so what they're going to do is they're going to be quiet. They're going to hang out along the edge of the pond where the big male bullfrog can't really see them, and when the females come in. They're kind of going to be sitting there like, yeah, yeah, oh, that was me. No, 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 yeah, that was me. I, uh, 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 maybe my throat's not working. Blah, blah, blah. But no, that was definitely me saying, here, let's let's go mate over here. And so some of the females will be intercepted by these males that aren't big enough to establish their own territory or, or call and attract a female properly. Um, for fall field crickets, they'll have the same. They'll have males that are smaller that can't uh, call as well, and they will um, um, intercept females as they come to the males. The other problem is, for fall field crickets, there's a parasitic fly that zone that um, zooms in on these crickets when they call. So the advantage for the skulking cricket is if it's quiet, it doesn't get parasitized by the fly, and then it also doesn't expose itself. So it doesn't expose itself to, to parasitism, uh, and then it doesn't have to do that much work to, to mate with a female. Um, so this guy could do all that calling, uh, never meet a female because she gets intercepted by these skulkers, and then a week later he's dead from being parasitized by the fly. So lots of, uh, again, cost to, to sexual reproduction in the whole display. Uh, sometimes there's collateral damage, like this poor uh, spotted salamander who uh, one frog thought, hey, maybe, um, maybe you are a female, and another one was like, well, if, that's a, if, if you think it's a female, so do I. Um, and... Um, well, this may look comical. The same thing can happen to females in the water, and, and they can be drowned. Uh, so there can be the that ultimate cost for for trying to reproduce sexually as well. Oh, uh, like this. This is uh, this guy here, the toad uh, on the right, uh, that's in amplexus with the larger female. He was there first. This other guy is just trying to butt his way in, um, and is working really hard to get in the middle there. Um, you know, and that can affect. This can affect the, the mating, and obviously it's an interruption, uh, among other things. And it certainly can affect this toad as well, its time, because if it's not successful there, it just wastes all this time trying to get between these two uh, when it could have been finding uh, another mate of its own. And toads will do the same thing, where um, if, if one male is really successful at calling, smaller toads will also hang out and try to intercept the females before they get to that male. Um, and if several toads were to grab onto a female, uh, and this is well-documented wood frogs, if several males grab onto a female and none of them let go, she can actually be drowned by the, 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 su the potential suitors. Um, I don't think the, the sound is going to come through in this, but I want to I show you this. Sometimes the, the display is just um, absolutely full of effort. Uh, this is a... I'm going to have to go back and look at the name. Uh, but this is a, a species of bird of paradise. And this is a really elaborate courtship. Hopefully you'll also notice there are uh, projecting feathers off the head. So there's some pretty extravagant um, structures. Look at the color of the neck. Almost looks like a little disco ball. Honestly, I hope some of you right now are thinking that guy's got some good moves. And I get an ad in the middle of the video. Western I miss, Western Parodia, if I'm saying that correctly. No. Yeah, Western Parodia. Um, and you can find some other videos of the, of the same bird on, on YouTube. Um, and it doesn't look like the female even responded positively. So not only are you doing all this, not only are you risking being seen, not only are you expending a lot of energy, you might not 
be successful as well. So in addition, you got to find a, a nice place. You've got to attract a female in, and then you've got to get their attention. So again, mating uh, is a lot of work. I know some of you might already know that because you've been married for however long or you've been in relationships. But, you know, in, in nature, um, when the critters don't live as long, you know, this can be a significant amount of time. And you've got unruly suitors. I, I don't want to ruin how many of you feel about your favorite marine mammal. Um, but r marine mammals are very, very insistent. Um, there are some really not um, – by human standards, there are some some really tough stories to read about uh, the consequences of mating, of of over amorous males that end up um, badly injuring or even killing females before they're able to mate with them in their rush to mate with them. So this is this is a danger as well. Um, in fact, if I can find it, um, I'm gonna read. There are some rules to being a female in uh, my favorite um, book here. I'm probably not going to be able to find that. Sorry. Um, and one of them is don't go alone. And another is if you see a group of males, go the other way. Um, my, my main experiences with this is, is wood frogs. You'll see a female come in. Uh, if you're if you're lucky enough to be at the right, there at the right time, the males come in first. When the females come into the pond, they hit the water and they go right to the bottom. <clears throat> and there are still males who are like, oh, hey, someone went by. Or a male will come in and all the males start going over and they're like, oh, wait, that's another male. They're very keyed in. Uh, and it can be a really dangerous time uh, for the females. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's injuries or fatalities. The males can get injured or or killed as well through these um, these these uh, mating displays. This is a white-tailed deer. Uh, those antlers get locked. <clears throat> Done. That's it. Uh, you know, if they're not able to get them apart, they could starve to death. And and I've read multiple uh, records where people have found you know a pair of male deer carcasses where they were. Um, uh, what you call it, uh, interlocked, their inners were interlocked, they were not able to pull apart, and they starved to death. Um, that, that can be real tough. And certainly they can get injured as well in these contests. Uh, I think the majority of the time, uh, the males, you know, can look at each other and want to be like, well, you definitely got the bigger act than I do, and they, they don't, they're not going to usually challenge. But if they can't make that distinction, and it does get to this point, the deer can become injured from these um, contests. So you spent all this time establishing a territory. You put the energy in that. You put the energy in the fine and female and you're mating. Then you have trust issues. Um, and it's not just uh, limited to uh, dragonflies and damselflies. But these are two very good examples where, um, you know, this is the, the wheel structure here and these uh, dragonflies are mating. Uh, and they'll often fly like this. And, and sometimes the male will not release the female until she's laid eggs. Uh, as you can see here on the left in these um, damselflies, I think these are variable dancers. Uh, but the male has not let go of the female. They're done mating because she would be connected up to the male uh, if they were still mating, just like the dragonflies on the right. Um, they have finished mating, but he's still holding on to her, trying to prevent her from mating with other uh, males. It's in her best interest to mate with more than one male so she diversifies her genetic stock uh, of her offspring for the male he wants to maximize his output with whatever females he mates with um so it's it's um one of those uh evolutionary arms races where they each come up with different ways trying to not uh trying to outwit their partner they still want to mate they still want to um you know have fertilized eggs but uh the the male wants to be to, to um, take up as much of the female's eggs as possible. The female wants to diversify that that output. Um, drones and queen bees, like in honeybees, uh, have, have went through this as well. There's a, there's some really neat accounts of how um, drones will um, try to plug up uh, the, the queen so that she can't uh, mate with any more drones, but the queen has ways of removing these plugs so that the drones, so that she can mate with other drones. Uh, it's really fascinating, and it's this evolutionary um, seesaw that goes back and forth, uh, where one has the advantage for a while, and then eventually selection favors, um, let's say selection favors the queens who are able to remove the plug, and then the some of the drones get better at uh, placing the plug in, and so the selection favors them as well. Uh, and those, and that's bore up in the uh, uh, in the genetics of of the population. Um, oh, and this is an interesting story. This is a macaque, and 
Um, speaking of some of the really strange costs for asex or for sexual reproduction, um, there's there was a article. This is a couple decades ago, but it's still a really interesting article where they found that um, macaques are more likely to attack other macaques when those macaques are having sex. That they will literally sit there, they'll act like they're not being that they're not paying attention um, and they even described it like they look down or they try not to look or they're fiddling with a stick or something the kinds of things you would you would uh, see in humans and then they can see the um, physical cues from the mating pair when they reach ejaculation and that's when they attack and they went through all these different um, research uh, uh, different attempts at, at trying to understand why this was happening. If this was uh, resource guarding, if the they were trying to prevent the couple from mating so that they wouldn't have more young, because more young would mean, um, you know, more competition for food uh, and, and resources within the, the community. Uh, and, and none of these bore out. And what they realized was this was just good old fashioned revenge. Uh, and it was often smaller males and females because the females were smaller than males because as the males got bigger, the revenge attacks would stop because the males were then bigger to just attack or establish whatever they um, grudge they had right then and there. Um, but the females, which are smaller, would stick, continue to resort to these attacks on macaques that they felt had, you know, wronged them, uh, and they would try to do it at this most vulnerable time, which was when they were reproducing. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons to to stay away from sexual reproduction. Uh, and again, you know, death is always a concern. Um, if you've heard me talk about uh, this topic before, you'll know that both of these situations are overblown with the, the praying mantis and the, the black widow, that yes, the females can be larger, and yes, they certainly will eat the males. That's only if the male doesn't get away. Um, many spiders will do that with because the females are so much bigger, but if the, um, the males bring something for um, the females to eat, uh, that can distract them. Uh, there is at least one species that feeds the female with themselves while they're mating, uh, which is an extreme example. Um, but these stories about the black widow and the praying mantis mainly came from laboratory settings where after the mating, um, the female rightfully was hungry from all that activity. Uh, and there was nothing else in the little habitat or enclosure to eat except the male and dinner time. Um, but if they're able to get away, then this, this does happen much, I think, more infrequently in the wild. But still, you know, eating the mate after uh, sexual reproduction is certainly a uh, a negative as well. Uh, and then sometimes the reproduction simply ends with, or you end with the reproduction. Uh, this is something our American eels do. This is a, a species of chameleon found in Madagascar. It's the shortest lived four-legged vertebrate in the world. They're born in, uh, they, yeah, they're born in November. By January, they're um, sexually mature. By February, they've um, laid the next generation of eggs and they die. Uh, and then the eggs uh, mature through the summer and they emerge and uh, hatch in the November and it starts all over again. Uh, so they're basically um, only live for a year. Uh, fascinating little critters. Uh, and then again, our American eels, which um, you know could be here for five years, could be here for 25 years, but eventually when they migrate back into the ocean to reproduce, uh, they are semiparous. They um, reproduce and that's it. Once after they reproduce, they die. Um, so sometimes, you know, that, that sexual reproduction is really great, but it only happens once and then you're done. So back to asexual reproduction. You know, I wanted, I wanted to point out that sexual reproduction, um, isn't all that it, it doesn't sound all that wonderful times. There's a lot of energy that goes into it, a lot of effort, a lot of uh, ways that can be harmful or backfire. Um, so, you know, what, what happens when you can just produce essentially a copy of yourself and be done with it. You don't have to worry about um, impressing another member of the species. You don't have to do all those courtships. You don't have to grow all these beautiful feathers or colors. You don't have to grow these massive bones on top of you. You don't have to do all that work. You just boink, pop one another one out. It's just like you and you already like you. So you're going to like the new one that comes out. This is great. So, um, so let's take a look at some methods of asexual reproduction. Uh, and again, this is a this is an aphid, uh, and they give this in addition to uh, reproducing asexually through uh, parthenogenesis. They also have uh, this live birth of the this of the um, 
the new aphids that they're producing. So aphids have some really interesting uh, things going on with their life cycle. Uh, and just a quick review, I don't want to give anybody flashbacks to uh, high school biology or college biology. I know there might be some of you that, that did that as well. Um, but meiosis is, and I want to talk real quick about meiosis and mitosis because they have two very different results. Uh, in meiosis, you have this nuclear division and it produces four cells. And each of the cells have essentially half the chromosome number. And this is usually, uh, this is often referred to, especially in like, um, you know, the multicellular organism, gametogenesis, because this produces the gametes, the sperm uh, and the eggs with the half of um, the chromosome number. So that when you have a sperm fertilize an egg, you have half of the um, chromosomes from the male, half of the chromosomes from the female, and this is produces genetic diversity because you're not getting the full genetics from one parent, you're getting half from each. Uh, this also, you know, can be responsible for, for everything um, from uh, genetic diseases to uh, genetic uh, resistance to diseases. Um, so it can be a blessing and a curse. Excuse me, and then mitosis is nuclear division where um, you have the same number of chromosomes in two cells. So it's a splitting of the cells. Uh, and this, this is obviously important for growth, but it can also be important as a... Um, in the methods of, of asexual reproduction. So the first one, which is going to be very similar to mitosis, is uh, binary fission. You got a cell and it splits into two very similar or identical cells. Uh, the archaea and the bacteria do this. Um, this is a pretty uh, quick and easy way. Uh, bacteria have a lot of mechanisms for absorbing um, other genetics from, from uh, their environment and from other cells. Um, so they find different ways to have Unfortunately, uh, considering some of the, the things that we, we deal with, with um, health and, and medical issues with bacteria, um, but they do still find ways to diversify their, um, their genetics. But essentially, the splitting in, in this particular type of reproduction is essentially identical, uh, two identical cells from the original cell. Uh, and I forget uh, actually what kind of cells these were. Uh, that this image was. Um, and then you have something like budding. Uh, budding is something you'll see in yeast or hydra, the yeast on the top and the, the hydra is the, the lower picture. Uh, and if, oh, I don't, I'm never sure if you guys can see my cursor or not, but these two structures, which essentially looks like the arms of the hydra, that's two new hydra budding. Um, and so they will eventually um, release from uh, the parent and uh, find their own place to attach. You can see like the hydra here is attached to this, this stick to the left. Uh, they will eventually release and, and attach on their own to um, their own uh, locations and, and grow into a full hydra. Whoops. Um, so this is sexual reproduction. It, and the new individual develops within the body wall or the cell membrane. Oops, sorry for the spelling there uh, of the parent, uh, but they'll cause a swelling and then eventually that swelling detaches and that's where and that new organism begins. Um, vegetative propagation, hopefully uh, many of you are familiar with this. Uh, this is my uh, cutting from my grandmother's spider plant, which has been a long time since she had that spider plant. Uh, this is my sister's, but it's been going and going. You can see more, um, more spider plants down there at the bottom. Um, this is believe aspen trees like I always seem to not remember but these aspen trees this is considered the largest organism on the planet um, it is this massive uh, group of uh, aspen trees which look like individuals but if you were to check their roots you see they're all interconnected so these are all clonal trees from the same uh, original tree um, I feel like this is if I remember correctly this is in Utah so it's fantastic, but you've got this vegetative propagation. Um, if we were if we were all together, I would ask everybody to raise their hands. They did that experiment in class where you took half a petri dish and put a little bit of water, and you cut a potato or you cut a carrot and you stuck it down in the water and you waited to see what happens. And you would eventually see stuff growing. As you can see, I got tubers there and and, and certainly uh, bulbs. This is um, you know, uh, something that I think uh, a lot of people that have gardens are, are very uh, familiar with this kind of asexual reproduction. Um, and again, these are, you know, I mentioned these are clonal, so they're all the same. So if you have, the, the downside to this is if you have something that's a disease, it's going to spread through all these because they are not genetically different. They're all essentially uh, genetically identical. And so um, disease or other um, 
<sighs> selection pressures of some kind that they can't quickly adapt to is going to be a problem within that group because they don't have uh, the, the variability to deal with uh, those kinds of pressures. Um, spore formation or spore genesis. I don't want to get into this too much because this can this can really take you down a lot of different roads, um, which just about everything in this thing. Um, uh, PowerPoint today I, I learned about there are so many different ways to things to go and to talk about. Um, but a spore is a reproductive cell that couldn't develop can develop into an individual without first fusing with another reproductive cell. So it can actually be um, half of the chromosome number. Uh, and you'll see this as uh, often as part of a life cycle stage in, in, in many different plants. Um, conidial fungi, which is this image right here, uh, and the red algae polysiphonia are a few examples of organisms that use uh, sporogenesis as a, uh, a method of asexual reproduction. So then we got fragmentation. Um, we didn't do this in science. This would be, I would have rather seen this than growing a, a potato or a, a, a carrot in a Petri dish. Um, and this is where you have uh, a new organism that grows from a fragment of the parent. You know, chopping and uh, accidentally cutting an earthworm in half, uh, the arm off of a starfish. If there's enough of the organism there, they'll do that. Um, uh, and this, you can find this from planarians. Planarians are those flatworms that at one end they have the two little eye spots with look like an arrow-shaped head. Uh, annelids, which is segmented worms, so that's everything from um, uh, oligochaetes and polychaetes, which are uh, really interesting types of worms, especially polychaetes, to earthworms and leeches is, are all uh, segmented worms. Uh, turbolarians, which is this right here, this is Bedford's flatworm, uh, which is really pretty. Um, or another example, these are groups of flatworms uh, and sea stars which are, and, and lichens, which is interesting, is that uh, lichens can often reproduce asexually by fragmentation. And that way, the um, two components of the lichen are already present, the, the uh, fungi and the algae. Uh, and so that is one real quick and easy way for them to uh, reproduce. Um, Parthenogenesis. This is one I think that gets talked about a lot, um, and this is one you tend to see in certain vertebrate species. Uh, honestly, if if I of all the things I looked at, the largest critter I could find that had this asexual reproduction reproduction it was through parthenogenesis is the Komodo dragon, and this is actually a Komodo dragon that um, was born as a result of parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is essentially female development, the development of an individual from an egg without that egg undergoing fertilization. Okay, so um, this could be a population where you have lots of females. Uh, this could be a population where um, individuals are spaced out quite a bit and it's hard for females to find males and they're like, fine, I'm just going to have another one of me because I like me and that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and so it can be obligate where it is exactly what that it's the uh, only way for that population to reproduce. It can be facultative, uh, which means they will, if the um, if the situation is requires it, you know, like I said, because they're spaced out and they can't find a male, um, or they get separate, their um, population gets separated, or there might be a um, environmental reason, perhaps something like uh, parasites or disease or some other reason to avoid sexual reproduction, uh, they can do it. Um, and then sometimes parthenogenesis is part of a bigger um, uh, life cycle where that's one of the stages, and um, but it's not the entire reproductive life cycle for that species, but it is a part uh, of that life cycle. Uh, and there's a pretty good list here. Water fleas, but that's the Daphne up here in the top. Uh, rotifers and aphids, as I showed you earlier. Uh, stick insects and ants, bees, parasitic wasps. And, and not every ant or bee, parasitic wasps. Uh, not every reptile, amphibian, or fish, but some uh, do have the capability to for this type of reproduction. Um, this is a zebra shark. And again, if it, she can't find a female, or if she can't find a male, she can re reproduce by parthenogenesis. Um, I'd actually never heard of the shark until I was doing this, so uh, I thought that was a really uh, neat photo of, of this organism. Um, these are, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's a, a type of whiptail lizard. This whiptail lizard in the center is the hybrid of these two species on the outside. So there's two ways to get more of this lizard. The first is that this lizard, which these are always female, 
um, reproduce parthenogenically. Uh, and they have females that have more females. The other way to get more of these lizards is for hybridization. And this species occurs naturally. This isn't um, one of those things where like you see the weird colored corn snake because they've been breeding them uh, in, you know, a bunch of uh, houses in, in the Midwest or something. This is a species that occurs naturally as a hybridization between these two other two species of lizard. Um, and again, they can produce more females, but they don't produce males. Uh, so you can either get more lizards through the hybridization, the natural hybridization, or through parthenogenesis. Um, and this uh, shouldn't be too shocking because if, if I'm trying to, I always can never remember this correctly. If you've got a horse and a donkey, they will produce a mule, but that mule is sterile. That mule is not going to be able to reproduce. So it can't obviously parthenogenically reproduce more mules, but this is very similar, except in this case, this lizard is absolutely able to reproduce asexually through parthenogenesis. Um, and you and obviously and and like the mules, of course, if you had the, this natural hybridization, you'll get more as well. Uh, Komodo dragon, the zebra, yep, yep. Uh, and and again, as I mentioned earlier, why not both? Um, you'll find some really interesting life cycles out here. So these are uh, this is a soybean aphid, um, and we're starting winter. You got an overwintering egg, and out hatches the stem mother, and the stem mother will produce wingless females. Uh, and then if you get some winged females, they can spread some more. But during this time here. All of this is parthenogenesis. Um, conditions are favorable. There might not be as many um, disease vectors to be worried about. There might not be as many predators. And so you can produce quickly using parthenogenesis. Yeah, sure, they're all going to be the same. But again, if you like yourself, then that's okay. Excuse me. Now, when you get to, excuse me, when you get to later in the, in the season, uh, into the fall, this is when you have uh, males begin to appear in the population. Males begin to get pre pre produced so that then you can have sexual reproduction between the winged males and the winged females to produce eggs that will overwinter. So it's perfectly okay early in the season into the summer to um, have clonal females and have very similar genetics. But as the times get a little tougher, there's a little more competition and you're preparing to overwinter, now, the, this um, population will ch will switch to males and females, where you can diversify up that genetics uh, and gear and have a um, better chance for your offspring to survive the the winter uh, and then emerge in the spring and uh, start the cycle all over again. Daphne uh, do the same thing. Uh, early on in spring into summer, they will reproduce uh, parthenogenically. Uh, they you know, they can produce a lot more. There's not as much competition. There's not as much predation yet. Um, certainly, there might still be fish, but there's going to be less. Um, usually, there's less insect predators uh, and certain other predators like that because they might be early in their. Uh, life cycle or their development and so the predators aren't there yet later in the summer when there's more predation and there's more competition uh, between the daphnia they will switch to um uh, reproduction that's male and female and again that um genetic variability gives their offspring more uh, viability gives them a more of a chance in the prevailing conditions to survive so the question um, I think that really comes out of this, um, you know, like I said, who needs love? Well, it depends on what you're looking for. OK, asexual versus sexual quick and easy copies, which is asexual versus some time and effort, but a genetic diversity, which can be very beneficial for the individuals and the populations. Uh, and one of the um, uh, where a lot of these ideas came from is the Red Queen hypothesis, which was a hypothesis that was put forward in the 80s. Uh, it's named after the Red Queen from Through the Looking Glass, uh, and specifically this, this quote, where now, here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. Um, and why does how does that relate scientifically? The Red Queen hypothesis states that um, the coevolution of competing species creates a, a dynamic, dynamic equilibrium in which the probability of extinction remains fairly constant over time. In other words, what that means is you have a, one species and it begins to evolve. 
that doesn't mean it's going to become better than all the species and it's just going to elevate itself above them and become dominant. The other species are going to evolve as well. So as this a species A evolves, species B will re, uh, evolve in response, which will cause species A to have a different kind of um, uh, evolving response. And so you have these selection pressures constantly happening. And so you get this um, kind of equilibrium um, that's dynamic. So, you know, um, it's one of the reasons I don't like the, the, the balance of nature because it, it makes people think that it's, you know, the critters are on a seesaw and they're just trying to get it level as possible. It's going to go up and down. And this is what happens. And there's so many great classical examples of evolution where you'll see where these um, uh, different kinds of selection pressures affect a population. But when they're um, when they reproduce, uh, especially with genetic variability, you can see how they can overcome it. And then that affects another population and then that affects another population. Um, and this has been used um, also to explain the evolution of sex or sexual reproduction uh, in that um, sexual reproduction evolved as a means of overcoming parasites, uh, which I, I just absolutely fabulous idea that um, by you know, um, no longer reproducing asexually. Because if you look at uh, the order of, of evolution, a lot of the or other critters that we talked about today, once you got into unicellular, you got a lot more asexual reproduction. But the further you go into complexity of multicellular organisms, the further you go up the evolutionary chain, if you will, um, you see um, more of a tendency towards uh, sexual reproduction. And so, and so why do we see that? Well, it, it could very well be mechanisms to avoid uh, parasitism. This is, uh, I'm just going to go for it. Potamoper, per, no, I'm not going to go for it. This is a snail uh, that you can find in New Zealand. Uh, and it's a really interesting story. I got, I got a book here. I want to pull a quote or two out of it. Um, but what happened was there was a gentleman who was interested in this idea of the Red Queen hypothesis and wanted to see if he could find some way to, um, find evidence that would support or not support this hypothesis um, in, a, in a natural setting. And he learned of these snails in um, uh, the, the lakes and streams of New Zealand, where in some, some uh, areas, the population was almost all female, where in other areas, the population had, you know, some males, like 25, 30% males and lots of females. Um, and he didn't know, and he wanted to see if he could figure out what was the mechanism. Why was there more males than females? Oh, when she, okay. Um, and what he found out was, um, he, you know, he went and got these snails and he cut them open to see if they had to look for a penis. And I guess you look behind the left tentacle. Um, and what he found was that the snail was full of what he thought was sperm. And it's great because he took it to a, a virology, a parasitologist to, to ask him about it. And he said, they're not sperm, you idiot, they're worms. And what it was is they were flukes. And this um, snail had been ca essentially castrated by these flukes. And they were reproducing inside the snail's body. And eventually they would uh, make it up to their final uh, host destination, which was ducks. Uh, and so when you were looking at these populations where there was these flukes, there were male and female snails, but if there was low to no um, parasite population, if you weren't finding these flukes in the snails, you were finding all females. And so they were they were switching to sexual reproduction in the populations where there were parasites to try to fight off the parasites and develop a, a, a resistance, uh, which is fantastic. Um, and it's something he learned. So this was in, um, I believe, in mountain streams and lakes. When he went to a different island, he found the correlation was between the shallow water and the deeper water, where the deeper water, there was less parasites than the shallow water. So in the shallow water, you found far more many males. And again, he was looking for the penis in the, in the snails. You found far more many um, um, uh, males in the shallow water where there was a higher preponderance of parasites. Um, this research moved on to uh, Nigeria and uh, I just want to read this a passage from this book because I thought this was really interesting. According to the parasitologist Stephanie Schrag, each year the snails have a penis season. 
The waters are coolest in northern Nigeria. We switched to Nigeria. I think I said that um, in December and January. The snails use the cool temperature as a cue to produce more offspring equipped with penises. Snails, in other words, that can mate with other snails. With more penises, there's more sex among the snails and more shuffling of their DNA and more variation in the next generation. The snails need about three months to mature, so this new sexually produced generation comes of age between March and June, and March to June happens to be the time of year when flukes are at their worst in northern Nigeria. So you have a population that's switching between these two mechanisms of reproduction uh, to um, resist parasitism. And so there are there is a, a pretty, I think, solid school of thought that uh, sexual reproduction uh, developed as a result of uh, parasitism or as a defense against parasitism. Um, as humans, you know, I think a lot of times we tend to see everything through our worldview and the, the norm for re reproduction is a male and a female um, and, you know, sperm and an egg and then you have a, a, a zygote and you have a new uh, embryo. Um, and I think it's fascinating to think that um, this method, which you know we take for granted, which is is what we do, uh, it was simply a uh, a result of trying to um, avoid parasitism. Uh, it's just it's just an amazing idea to me. Uh, so, anyways, um, I believe that's what I had for today. Like I said, um, I wasn't really sure where it went, but it, it's fascinating to me to think that you know we have these two different types of uh, reproduction, and they're very much um they seem very different but um, one probably arose from the other as a uh, a means of uh, getting rid of parasites which is just fantastic so anyways um hey thank you all for joining me i i'm not necessarily going to run away from you yet uh, but i want to say thank you because sometimes i get to the questions and a bunch of people leave uh which i get uh you know if you if you if you heard what you want you heard what you want um but if you have questions, uh, please, I will try to answer them as best I can. Um, I'm not in, I'm not a sex expert, um, but I'll try to answer uh, any questions you have. Uh, but if you want to take off, um, that's the end of the, the, the forum presentation. Uh, and I appreciate you being here tonight. So th thanks for coming out. Um, Connie, I see you've got your hand up if you want to unmute. Actually, I, I thought I was waving at you, which we do on Zoom. That's the thing I want to thank you. No problem, I'll wait. Um, Good Bernard? job, and thank yeah, you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, um, I read somewhere that earthworms uh, actually do not um, uh, reproduce by, when you split them, oh, the, the, I think it's the head, the, the, high, the part, portion that has that big bulge in it, mm -hmm. that's the one that regenerates and the other one just dies. So you might want to check up on that. I will, yeah. It, it's probably not all annelids, but some of them can, and earthworms might not. Um, and you know, thank you for bringing up earthworms, because I forgot to mention um, one of the things I didn't talk about was her hermaphrodism, hermaphroditism, hermaphroditism, and um, well, I really stumbled on that word. Um, and you know that there are organisms that have male and female reproductive organs, but oftentimes they will still reproduce sexually. It's hard. It's easier. Um, or sometimes it's um, that advantage, like in earthworms, is that you're not going to run into other individuals very often. So if you have both parts, you're prepared to mate with whoever you meet because you both have everything you need to mate. Did you have another question, Bernard, or is your hand just still up? No, that's all. That's oh, no all. problem. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, earthworms, you know, in, are, are fascinating. Worms in general can be really interesting. Anyone else have a question? You can just unmute. You don't have to raise your hand, too. So that'd be, I think, far easier for me. Oh, I couldn't have done that good a job. Did I put everybody asleep? How does um, sexual reproduction um, prevent uh, parasitism? Well, it's, 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 it, you got to look at the, um, uh, the population as a whole when you vary the gen when you vary the genetic uh pool it makes it harder for uh things like disease to spread through the pool if everybody had like if you if you get a disease remember that that clonal colony i showed you of the trees if you have a disease that really affects that tree 
one of those trees hard, it's going to spread through that group like wildflower because they're all the same. Uh, one of the things they talk about now with bananas and the, and the bananas that we eat, and I believe they're the Cavendish variety, which until like two years ago, I didn't even know we had, there was such a thing as different bananas. Um, the, they're all clones and they're starting to deal with, um, I can't remember if it's, if it's a blight or some kind of disease that affects them. And it's very possible that in another decade or two, we won't have Cav Cavendish bananas anymore because they're all clones and they're all essentially genetic, genetically identical, identical, which means they're all um, susceptible to this disease. And you're not going to, without that genetic variability, you're not going to have individuals in the population that develop a uh, or have a resistance that they can pass on. So a lot of times if you have a disease that really or parasites that really do a number in a population, there will be some individuals that through genetic variability have a better resistance or or an outright um, um, a lack of susceptibility. That's a different word I'm looking for, but that lack of susceptibility. And so they're more likely to reproduce uh, and they're more likely and because they're more likely to reproduce, they will push that uh, gene pool towards um, more individuals that can uh, resist or or not get that infection or not get that parasite. And so that's how um, having sexual uh, uh, sexual reproduction and all that genetic mixing and variability can really help a population and then be that. So it might not always be good for the individual, but it's good for the uh, population as a whole. Now, if you want to see a good example of this, uh, which is probably potential, of the National Mall, um, well, the, as you know, the, the elm blight is, the, the, the elm, Dutch elm disease is really, you know, did a, 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 a work on the elm. And so they've developed various types of varieties that, um, which they are basically cloned, um, which are uh, somewhat uh, less susceptible to the uh, to Dutch elm disease. Now, what they did was by the White House, the National uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue, they planted a row of Princeton elms. Which after about 10 years, they're still reasonably doing well, but people, somebody commented that this is probably the dumbest thing they can do because Princeton is not completely resistant and someday it's going to get in there and the whole row is going to go all at once. And that's what happened when you, they say we recommend it, when you, get, when you get a clone, when you get a clone that you've developed to prevent disease, you don't plant them together, you just plant one or two, one or two near each other. It's a very yeah. interesting thing. So watch what happens on the, those the elms on, on, Prince, on Pennsylvania Avenue, north of the White House. See and see just what happens when they finally do get infected. Interesting. I keep an eye on that for sure. Any other questions? All right. Well, um. I, I'm probably going to head out then. If nobody has any questions, I'll hang around for another minute or two. But thank you, everybody, for uh, joining me tonight. Um, what's next month? Next month's March. Oh, I got two next month. I'm doing one on uh, cottontails, and I'm doing one on spring ephemerals. I'm going to bring that one back from that was, I think, the first year I did this. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to talking more about that. There'll be more bl uh, blood root uh, in that one as well. Um, and I believe I might also be doing... Um, they're doing some uh, cherry festival on this side of the Potomac in Arlington. Uh, and so I might be doing something on uh, the critters that depend on our native cherries. So hopefully I'll see several of you next month as well. Thank you. I think, oh, go ahead. Will you be sending out an email with that information regarding the other um, meetings that you're talking about? Uh, so they are, I, I think you can find them already on the website and under the programs. Um, but yeah, I can I can include a link to that as well uh, when I send out the uh, a link to the recording into the survey. Thank you. No problem. Uh, thank you for doing this again, Ken. Oh, no problem. I enjoy it. I'm glad you guys were here. Yep. See you in the next one. <laughs> Absolutely. Ah, you hear the little voices in the back. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs>